The model is not, if you think positively, you'll create your life and everything good will happen and you'll never have any pain. That's bullshit. Like for every single person on the planet, I don't care how much status you have, how much money you have, how much meditation you've done, some things suck, some things don't suck. A lot of things suck. I mean, it's like pretty shitty a lot of the time, right? And then sometimes the good things happen, right? Every baby when they're born should get a chart that says, this is how your life is going to go. I hate to tell you, right? And there's nothing you can do about that shit. That's the way it is. And what you can do is be in a state of loving connection with the universe and know that it's all fine. My family is a little weird. I was raised by a theoretical physicist, my father, and then two lesbian therapists, and then my sister, his artist, and me, who were from a young age, a scientist, and I fell in love with my father's version of science. So my father's version of science is not the kind that is taught in schools. He's a very good physicist, but the way he does it is more like, it's a spiritual path. I would say, what did you do today, you know, daddy? Well, I derived whatever such and such equation. I'm like, so what, the equation already exists? He's like, yes, but when I derive it, it gives me a very good feeling. And I'm like, ah, he's doing science as sort of a mystical path for his well-being. And I saw that and I could see that when he was in that frame, he had obsessive compulsive disorder, it was very severe. And when he was in the frame of the flow of deriving equations or working on physics papers, it would go away. It's just a completely beautiful world of flow, and it was a healer for him. And I thought, ooh, science is a healer? Are you kidding me? I'm doing it. And so I would experiment around the house with him. He would ask different scientific questions, and I would try to answer them. But at the same time, there are these two lesbian therapists, right? And they're all about what is the inner experience? of the human being. What is it like on the inside in a way that's invisible but important, right? So from them, I got that. But in school, I was taught this kind of science that was neither of those things. It was uh, science is memorization, science is critical and logical thinking, there's no intuition or insight involved. And would you please just learn these facts? Now, I happen to be really good at learning the facts. Over and over again, we were taught that that's what science was. Now, I knew that wasn't what science was because of my father and because of understanding people's inner states. But I sort of shut up and listened and got A's and did well in school. But in the back of my mind, I was always looking for what is this mystical, what is this mystical piece that's missing in science education? And I shut it down almost completely when I went to graduate school. I went to a very competitive graduate school at UC San Francisco. And at the time, it was the best place in the world to go if you wanted to be a neuroscientist. I ended up shutting down this other part because I was very materialistic. I said, I would like to study dreams. And they said, oh, what a way to ruin your career. I would like to study consciousness. That's horrible. Please don't do that. I'd like to study meditation. Are you kidding? Like, would you study this frog or potentially a rat? And, <laughs> and I said, all right. For someone else, they're in love with the frog. And for someone else, this works perfectly for them. And they're in that mystical state with the frog. And they're just in joy, right? They're in flow. They're in that same state I saw my father in and that I wanted to be in and that I had been in. But for me, I shut it down. And I thought, I guess I just don't have the right ideas. And then I got a smack. I mean, a mental smack in my mind when I remembered that since I was a kid, I have been having dreams of future events that are real, that happened. And I had been taking a dream journal, writing it down since I was a kid, and I could see the details. I remember now being a kid and talking to my future self. I remember now being a kid and having agreements with my future self. I remember the whole thing and that it just had gone away because it wasn't allowed in this materialist graduate school. And I left the graduate school. Now I'm 54 and I'm like, 
that's hilarious that I forgot that, but I needed to forget it. I think I, that's the interesting thing when you look at things in the course of time, right? You start to say, okay, I needed to forget that. I wasn't gonna be able to get into that graduate program. I wasn't gonna be able to do the work I needed to do, learn the things I needed to think, and realize that I had the smack unless I had forgotten what the smack reminded me of. I think that's how it works all the time with scientists. It doesn't matter what the smack is. And I think it works all the time with people who aren't scientists. I think this is how we transform. And to me, that's doing science. You're coming face to face with nature as it is, with nature as it really is. And you're loving that. You see the connection between yourself and what really is. And that's where the love is. You're not distancing or blocking it out or saying it's not true. Here it is. So that's the key. I think that's the key experience. And it happens over and over again. But that was the first time. I have been a person who has the capacity sometimes to predict future events. And I've tested myself, of course, as a scientist. I've been studying this precognition ability. I've tested other people, I've tested myself. I've tested experts, I've tested people who don't think they can do it. And my experience for myself is that it comes upon me unbidden. So I can put myself in a state where I'm more likely to have an understanding of something important in the future. And I can have dreams which are unbidden, they just come to me. Sometimes lucid dreams where I can ask. But it's this feeling that comes with it of sureness. And it can either be words about someone or something. It can be a picture. It can be um, just a feeling that has no words or picture associated. Or it could be, I have no idea what's going on, but I have to do something. There's something I have to do and I don't know why. Uh, when my husband was sick at the time, he was my boyfriend, and he had an oxygen tank. And so he, he would spend all day at home and just kind of like trying to survive. And he's fine now, but he was trying to survive. And my son was about 11 and he would ride his bike home from school. And his job was to take it and put it in the garage and lock the garage. I see him through the window. He goes to the garage. And for some reason on this day, I say to myself, he didn't lock the door. I know he didn't lock the door. I start to get upset. He didn't lock the door. He walks in the house and I say, you didn't lock the door. He's like, yeah, I did. I don't think he locked the door to the garage. What's the deal? I just came home from school. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I locked the door. What is your problem? You did not lock the door. I get upset at him for no reason. And uh, I just go over this and over this. And finally, my boyfriend, between breaths on his oxygen machine, says, just go out to the garage and check the door. Do it yourself if you don't think he locked. So I go out there. He did lock the garage. And I was like, oh, I suck as a mom. <laughs> like, why did I do this? And on the way back, I see the electrical meter uh, where all the electricity goes into the house, the main area, is on fire. On the opposite side of the electrical meter is my uh, boyfriend's oxygen tank. And so there's an electrical fire in our house that my son did not notice, but I noticed. And I noticed ahead of time and was able to turn off the electricity, call the fire department, everything's fine. But if I didn't get pissed off at my son for not locking the door, I don't know what would have happened, some kind of explosion. Many people talk about that. Soldiers will talk about this a lot. Soldiers who have survived will talk about how, you know, one time I just had the urge, I had to get up and pee, and I had to pee over there. But over there turns out to be away from the place where some kind of explosion went off, right? So this is very common human trait. Where I've gone with consciousness is that there is a, like an informational substrate, I wanna call it an informational substrate, like a ground from which grows everything else, everything. It's just information, it's not physical, right? If anything, it's in the mental. And the informational substrate feeds what we call the physical world, and it feeds what we call the mental world. So it feeds what we think, it feeds the physical world. So it's like this coming up. 
right? It's like a tree with two branches, physical and mental. This is the informational substrate. And the mental has parts that is conscious and part that is unconscious or non-conscious. And they're both very important. And we talk a lot about the conscious part because we're conscious of it. <laughs> but the unconscious part is 95% uh, of it, if we talk about it less. But it's the unconscious part is closer to the informational substrate. So the informational substrate comes up here. Here's the unconscious. And then the cherry on top is the conscious. By the time things happen at the conscious level, it's already happened, right? We already experience it. But the conscious mind loops back. It loops back with its intention to affect the informational substrate like this. And the physical world, if it has consciousness, if it has intention, it could loop back too. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I don't get it. Um, but maybe there's a way that that happens too. And I call this a causal loop of this intention, intentional causal loop. It, the way any cause happens is through this loop. But there's also an intention in the informational substrate, which can also be called the collective unconscious. Sometimes I like to call it the pervasive universal consciousness. So it has different names, but basically in this informational substrate, it has its own intention that is affected by our intention, but is not only our intention. The other impact is the intention of the informational substrate itself and everyone else in the universe and anything that's conscious, including potentially AI, including this chair. Maybe, I don't know, right? We don't understand consciousness, so question mark. We have a vote, but we don't have a majority rule. Sometimes I use these uh, like cards that have pictures on them to remind me of things, but sometimes I don't. Well, anyway, last night I used these cards and the one I associate with myself, Moss Bridge, is the one that has a bridge on it and it has a little moss and that's the one I associate with myself. and. I pulled that card last night, and for the first time, I decided I wanted to find the author's or the illustrator's interpretation of what they thought this card meant. So I looked it up, and it said, um, making a bridge is a gift, being a bridge is a greater gift. And I thought, wow, I wonder if I'm making a bridge or being a bridge. The polarity can be healed with love. and. And that doesn't mean they're now one thing. These are very different things. So you have mind and, and body, but the distance between them in our thinking can be healed with love. That is making a bridge. Being a bridge is shutting up about all that and just being a portal or an opening for the love, for the Hindu, mystic Mirabai said, an oasis for each other our eyes should be. That's being the bridge. Sure, it can be hard to be the bridge in a world where the bridge doesn't even exist in the first place, kind of, but it's also healing. The work is really about using love skillfully and accessing unconditional love thoughtfully and mindfully, it's a whole different world. So how that changes education, it changes war. So now when people want to change the world, now you have these mental arguments about, let's try to get the whole country that wants the world to be this way, to think this way, to affect the informational substrate in this way. It becomes a completely different world. I'm not saying it's better, but it's a different model of how to be. And I guess I do think it's better because the vehicle is love. And so you can't help it when you start to access unconditional love as a habit. I'm not saying I do it all the time. I'm just saying you can't help it when you start to access unconditional love as a habit to start to feel more love for people and yourself on a regular basis. And that changes how you are in the world. So I do think it would be better. I do think it's supported by science. And I think we're getting there. I also think we're going in that direction. I also think people are starting to recognize the invisible and the power of intention, relationship, and love. 
And so it's happening. Just sometimes things take time. <laughs>